remarks in, uh, in about an hour or so. Um, uh, I'm not going to do a long introduction, but um, we last session of the day is going to be by, uh, by Andrew, um, and he's going to tell us uh, some more, something more about Walker Marsh. So I'm very interested to, to hear what he has to say. So, um, Andrew, take it away. Okay. Hello. Thank you. I just want to check at the back, can you hear me? Perfect. Okay. I'm going to start with a little story because it's the end of the day, a bit of a graveyard shift. So get some interest going. A long time ago in a city not far away, well, Amsterdam, about 2006, I was the founder of a company that's become quite famous in the Netherlands. That was PriceWise as we named it at the time, which has become PriceWise. And they make the worst adverts on TV. I'm sure you've seen them if you're Dutch. Well, like most things, when you do a startup, you know, you tend to spend far too much money Things are taking a really long time, and you don't really have any success. In fact, we started getting a tiny, tiny bit of visitors at the very, very end. When we'd run out of money, we were getting really scared. I mean, really scared. We had over half a million invested. Like, what are we going to do? We were advertising. People were coming to the site. They weren't buying. So what I persuaded the CEO to do was to make a report. Oh, yeah, there you go. Mountain of cash, taking too long, every project. And the report is really simple. Just compare the energy cost of last time versus this time. And so we could say what the percentage increase was. Nothing spectacular, not by today's standards with reporting, but it was enough. And we gave it to the Dutch Bureau of Statistics, and they took it to the Toyota camera the next day. And they discussed it on the, in the Toyota camera. And the next day, you know, the Telegraph put us on the front page because we had made this report, and they were astounded at the price changes. It's not like today where we see price changes all the time. And we went from this much traffic to that much traffic overnight. And it continued because the next day the NRSA, they did it, and then the Volkskrant did it, and, then, and, and so on. And so it kind of, kind of ended up being a consistent run rate. And when we built the servers, when we built the system, we had no idea how much it would take to be able to support that many people. In fact, we never thought we would get 50,000 visitors in a day. It was just beyond our scope of imagination. But luckily, it all hung together and worked really well. We, in that first week, basically covered most of our investment. So what I'm trying to illustrate here is, you go viral, shit can happen, and it better work. Luckily, it worked this time. So my name's Andrew Killen. Um, I'm also the lead admin for WordPress Hosting Group on Facebook. So if you want to go and ask questions about hosting, go and search on Facebook. You'll find a group of about 20,000 people, and they'll help you. And I also work for a Serpol. We say that we're the fastest hosting company in the world, but we've also got the stats to prove it. Um, yeah, everybody says they're the fastest. Of course they do. That's marketing for you. But if you want to talk statistics and all the rest of it, then we can prove it. What I do for them is look after all the products that are for our customers. So we've got an optimizer tool that helps to improve the speed and, and stuff of WordPress. We've got also lots of things that work on Cloudflare to do better CDN, better this, better that. So that's my kind of background. Oh, and I've been doing this stuff for the web since 1994. So I've got a little bit of experience. Don't worry. It's all up here. So if you just go to GitHub forward slash Andy Killen, you can find it's one of my pinned repositories. It's got a link to this presentation. It's got a link to all the things I talk about today. It's got in other instructions. It's got a spreadsheet. So if you want to play along with what I'm doing, you can do it. Yeah, you don't have to take photos of every slide. It's already there for you. So the facts. To me, <coughs> This is not boring, but I think there's only two or three major highlights. And I can't use this because, oh, here we go, let's see. No, man, 57% of shoppers will go international. So we're Dutch, we can take people from other countries, they'll do it. Okay, I suspect that's more talking about AliExpress, but hey. Um, shipping is the great, biggest problem, and taxes, that's main taxes, that'll be America. Complicated checkouts, yeah, there are problems. <sighs> Mobile abandonment for carts is 84%. 
But none of these really talk about performance. If you want to go and see all of these kind of stats, there's a link that goes to Forbes. They've got a whole article about it. So for me, there's two big stats, though, and that's WooCommerce is 29% of the web, and mobile devices aren't really working that well with, with e-commerce right now. So doing things to make that better would be good for everybody. This is what we want. This is our goal. This is where we want to be. So if you're clever, you've already done a bunch of things. These are all that kind of front-end work or standard stuff that you're going to do. So Lighthouse with Chrome, you're going to go and check what's the problem. And you're going to get a report. And you're going to work through each part and fix them. And then you're going to look at the server logs and see what PHP is complaining about. You fix them. Slow logs from MySQL, same, same. And then you check the browser console, make sure you've got no JavaScript errors. You've chosen a lightweight theme. You've got the latest plugins. You're all the latest versions. You've done everything that you think you can do. And this is kind of your standard starting place. OK, before we go on to what will help, let's talk about what's not necessarily true. People tend to think that PHP memory size will make your website faster. So if you've got more memory to give to PHP, like 500 to half a gigabyte, it'll make it faster. This is not true. It just means it'll be slower when it fails. What's happening is it's going to use up all that memory to try and do the processing before it fails. So in fact, if you can reduce that memory size, as much as, all, as much as possible, it will fail quicker. So in fact, smaller PHP memory is better. It's not always simple to get there, because not everybody's code is great. Some people's code is very hungry. And you just need that to make even a good bit of code work. Uh, post revisions make it slower. Well, not really. If you've got a well-optimized um, database, it'll be OK. But you should think about it in a sustainability sense. Why say 50 revisions when I only need the last three? So let's just keep it a bit uncluttered. It's not changing performance, though. Ajax cart fragments are slower. We don't hear this so often anymore, but I still hear sometimes. If you're working with a CDN doing rope edge caching, you definitely need Ajax cart fragments just to make it fast. Yeah. It's very common that people will say the front end, and they'll try and fix it there. Eh, we've already covered that. And if it's still slow, it's got to be the server. Redis fixes everything, or Redis, if you prefer. Um, it definitely will make the back end slow, uh, faster. It definitely will help in certain places, but not all the time. It's not a panacea. It's not the ultimate goal. It's not the ultimate fix. Oh. And so we begin. We've got a bit of a level set. We want it to go fast. We don't, we're going to ignore the myths, and away we go. So first things first, you want to make sure your database is using the right kind of tables. It probably is, but just make sure. And then also set uh, the right indexes. You're going to need something to deal with the autoload of the options table, so that everything that's autoload equals yes is found quicker and loaded quicker. Simple as that. It just reduces the time. And that's for every single time that WordPress loads. And then meta value. At the moment, there's an index on meta keys, if I remember rightly. But there isn't one on meta value. So if you have to find all of the prices that are under a certain amount, it's going to take longer if there's not an index on that meta value. So if you want to speed things up, always do that. And yeah, Unix cron is way more reliable than the standard WP cron. The, the one from WordPress, the standard, it needs somebody to come to the website to trigger it. And if no one comes, nothing happens. And sometimes there can be a lot of activity it needs to do when that first visitor comes, maybe after a day. And it's got to do all, all sorts of work. This will really slow it down for the customer. So if you set up the Unix cron, it's very simple. Then it will then, every minute or every five minutes, go and check if there's anything new to run, with or without a visitor to the site. Oh, and if you want to help with these bits, the optimizer plugin, Serpa Optimizer, will just do it for you to push your run. I know it because I made it. Well, actually, I maintain it. Somebody else made that bit. So if things are going really slow, 
and you can't work out what plugin it is or whatever. You can use Query Monitor. I can show you Query Monitor very quickly. Let's see. Okay. This is where I need my glasses. Oh. So, as you can see, here's Query Monitor, and what it will do is it will look for everything, and you can see from the timing over here how long it's taking, and it will show all of the bits, and you can focus in on whatever plugin you want, or whatever part, so if I look at WooCommerce, I can see which bits are taking longer, and I can do that for any plugin that I've got loaded, and see exactly which query is taking longer. And there is often surprising duplicates or surprising queries Often when there's an update, there might be a problem where they haven't tested it fully and something slows down and you might want to revert to an older version to keep your speed. So this is a really handy tool, tool to make this happen. As you can see, we've got duplicates all over the place from payments and automatic and all sorts of other people. So, Matt, your code's not good enough, mate. Okay. So, yeah, taxonomies. It's really easy in WooCommerce to forget to use taxonomies, to set values or attributes to the singular product rather than thinking of a group of products. It's just like, oh, I have a pair of shoes I'm selling and they're size 42, and I just put that one number against that pair of shoes. But really what I should have is a whole taxonomy for shoes. So, for example, with shoes, maybe I want the brand, maybe the material that's made with, the sole, target group, like male, female, unisex, children, whatever. And so it would be much easier to work out, give me all of the Nike shoes for men that have leather, would be three taxonomies that are checked to see if something is existing in all three of those rather than looking at all of the data and going, oh, is there something with this and with that and the other thing? And not forgetting that the product attributes, when they're put in by hand against the product, they're actually then serialized, so they're harder to read again. So having a taxonomy is ultimately faster. It just really speeds things up when requesting stuff. So here's an example of a product. I want the first 24 of it published. Its relationship is answered. It must be in both of these. So it's in Nike and men, and will show me the results of that. So that's a really quick way, in comparison, then searching through all the post-meta, looking for something that might or might not exist. OK, next step. It's a good idea to let other things do the work, to offload some of the effort so that your, your system is focused on making sales. Because that's what you want, you want money. So get yourself a CDN, there's a handful that are recommended there. Um, I recommend personally Cloudflare, I've used Fastly and KeyCDN before, they're good products, I've not used Bunny, but yeah, Cloudflare for me works. Security. This is why I like Cloudflare, because it's not just a CDN, it's also security, it's also this, it's also that, which kind of helps. You could use security, various others. Image crushing, just to make your page load quicker. Again, Cloudflare, so I've got three things covered by that already. There's a, an element there called polish that will make the images smaller as it dynamically loads the page and will convert it to WebP as needed. So you don't have to think about those kind of things. So it reduces your problems. Uh, resizing, oh my god, Cloudflare again. You can resize on, uh, online as you're sending the um, page to the client and make all of the thumbnails, make all of the other bits without actually having to create those images on your server. So that can really speed things up. Yeah, image stores, you can store stuff outside of your server. Where this is really incredibly handy is if you're planning to move from one host to another and you've got like 100 gigabytes of images, 
if they're already somewhere else, you can just focus on the code base and the database for the migration and not have to worry about this mountain of images that you're going to have to deal with. And they just stay in the same place and you get no disruption of service at all. Uh, product feeds. Uh, I really like a product here in the Netherlands called Product Flow. Uh, ironically, it's made by a friend, a former colleague of mine. But what is nice about it is it connects via the JSON API, checks what you need, uh, what it needs, and then it will put it straight into Blocker. We'll put it straight into uh, Bolpent.com. All of those other names that you know in the Netherlands, plus the other ones like the feeds into Google, feeds into Facebook, or those kind of multinational ones. And uh, yeah, it's a very simple product, and it costs literally no power on your machine, because it's not doing it there, it's doing it elsewhere. Yeah, well, you're not going to video host on your own machine, I hope. And search. Uh, Elasticsearch is possibly the best one for e-commerce, but Algolia will also do e-commerce quite nicely, and they will host it for you. And you can make incredibly fast home pages which have uh, kind of user generated, user um, yeah, uh, metrics generated content. So somebody comes from your, to your site, you could look maybe which country they're from and then deliver something else based on the search that you make to Elastic and create a different home page. That can be very fast and very useful. And all of these things do stuff without it happening on the server. So your server is focused on product sales and nothing else. Okay, so one of the biggest problems I see from talking to people is they'll use something like um, All-in-One Import Pro and they'll add all of their products using it, great. And then they'll try and use it to update the products, pricing, uh, stock values, all sorts of other stuff. And this can take several hours. Um, I did it once with a friend, they had a Vida Excel, sorry, Vida XL, um, uh, feed. There were 70,000 products and it took six and a half hours to go through all of the products, which was a bit slow. So I worked it out with them how it worked and basically downloaded the, well it's XML from them, but I could use JSON or CSV. Downloaded that using cron on an hourly basis. So that is faster than doing a PHP because Unix doesn't have that extra overhead. And then I'd start to process the updates a little bit later. So give it enough time to download the, the thing. So this could take, I don't know, two seconds, but give it a little bit of time. And then select from the database the information that I want to check. In this case, I'm going to use the price as my example. So select all of the products I have and get every SKU, because that should be unique, every post ID so it's in the post table, and the price. So there we go. That's my re result that I want to have. So post ID 5 is ABC123, blah, blah, blah. And then I get the contents from the feed and set it up with an array where the SKU becomes the key. And that means I can really quickly see if that SKU exists in the feed. I don't have to go and look through the whole feed each time or run an expensive query each time. The data has been processed to make it really accessible. So I can go, okay, if this SKU exists and the data, the price has changed, then I'm gonna apply the change using update post meta. So that going, went from six hours to about 12 minutes. I think today with the current processing, this would take more like 30 seconds, if not a little bit less for 70,000 records. And the database that they had they had a little over 10,000 products that they were using. So there's 10,000 SKUs in a nice little array, and then I loop through them all. I have, from that um, Git repo, there's a link to a uh, gist example of how to do this. So you can go and grab the code, do it yourself. So yeah, this can take away immeasurable amounts of time. And also processing. If your server is really busy doing something else, then it can't be selling product for you. Okay, anybody who's done a computer studies degree would know this. There's two really hard things in computer science, cache and validation and naming things. If you ever tried naming a website, that'd be one. Okay, so 
there's a bunch of events that happen on your website that cause cache invalidation or purging. And we've decided we're going to have a CDN, so we want to update the CDN every time there's a change. So it's not CRUD because we're not reading. It's just create, update, and delete. Every time that's happening, we need to tell the CDN, hey, this is gone. This has changed. And that could be from metadata, comments, taxonomies, reviews, or schedule events, or whatever else you've coded. OK? So yeah. Now, there's a bunch of different strategies you can take, and they mostly have problems. First one is you're just going to clear the page URL, because that's the only thing that's changed. Well, that's OK, but on the home page, maybe the price hasn't updated, or that review that you've just got in isn't showing, or something else. So just getting rid of the page URL isn't good enough. Most caching plugins will get rid of the entire domain. We'll just go, like, get rid of everything. But that's got a problem because you get rid of all of the CSS or the images or the, or the JavaScript and everything else you might have on that website. Plus, it gets rid of every single page, so everything gets to be processed fresh and new, meaning that your, your server is going to be constantly busy, just creating the same thing time and time again, and that's not ideal. So maybe you want to do the page URL and all the related URLs. OK, let's imagine that I have a shoe shop. I love shoes, obviously. And um, I have the main category of shoes in product category. So the first level is shoes. The next level is, I don't know, uh, boots. And then the level below that could be short as opposed to long ankle boots. Everything that's in that lowest category will also be in all of the other categories when it comes to purging because they will exist in the pagination of that product group. So obviously the shoes product group will have everything that's boots, it will also have sneakers, it will also have everything else. And that could be with, uh, well, let's say there's uh, 900 products and you're doing nine items per page, that's 100 pages of pagination. Simple as that. So if you've got that times by lots more products and lots more subcategories, you could end up really quickly with 10,000, 20,000 pages that need to be purged to make sure everything's up to date. I've got a little spreadsheet that I made for this. OK, so one second. So let's imagine I've got 1,000 products, and I've got nine products per page, and I just use two taxonomies that are public. So that's a pay, category page and the tag page. And let's imagine that I'm just putting six tags on each product. I'm going to end up with um, approximately yeah, 34 uh, seconds of uh, purging for only the HTML. Now that's if I'm purging 30 items per time, which is what Cloudflare allows. If I was only purging one URL per time, that would take 17 minutes just to purge that many products. And that's not what you want. You want your products to be instantly updated. So the answer to this, in fact, is a thing called cache tags, which is slightly different in the way that it works. So yeah, page URL plus cache tags. So I'll try and explain what cache tags do and how they work. Actually, here we go. That's the idea that if something's in this lower term, it's also in this upper term, and it belongs to the whole taxonomy. So we have these buckets, and they get named. So shop will be the shop page. RSS feeds could be all of your RSS feeds, could just be the singular home page. Product category, clothes, it could be product category, shoes, could be product category, cars, it doesn't matter. And I have a product tag called sales, and I have a thing called products. Now let's imagine I have a URL for a jacket that I'm selling. I'd want to put that into the category clothes. I'd probably want to have it in the category jackets. 
winter yasin, whatever. It's going to be in there, many different categories. So each category ends up with its own bucket. I also want it to be on sale at the moment, and I also want it to be part of product. So when I empty that bucket, all of the URLs that are contained within it are purged in one go. So this bucket could hold millions of URLs. And if I want to update all of the sale items, I've just changed my pricing so it's no longer 25% off, it's 50% off. It would just be one request to change all sale items in one go. And that will obviously improve speed dramatically. So your service is not as busy talking to the purging agent, and also your caching is just updated instantly. So from your cache tags, is there more complex to implement? Okay, it's in Serp Optimizer, but you end up having to have the enterprise versions of whatever uh, CDN you, you need. So whether it's Fastly that's got it, Bunny CDN's got it, Cloudflare's got it, they all have this capability, but it costs more money. So if you're a big site, this is going to be really handy. So, a website visitor is coming in from this end, and in an ideal world, they're going to hit the CDN and come back again. So it's like 20 milliseconds to make the page. But then they could have to go here. Maybe there's a reverse proxy, depending on your hosting, and then it comes back. So that, depending on where that is, that might be 100, might be 200, might be a second. Then we maybe have WordPress transients that can control the whole page, and then it gets sent back. But eventually, it come, could come all the way back to here, where it has to actually create the page afresh and then get sent all the way back again. When you're judging the performance of a server, you don't really want to judge the performance of all these caches. They're all very nice, but they don't show what it costs really to make the website work. They show what it costs the second time. Because the first time you need to build everything, and then you can show the cache. If there's somebody comes along that's totally fresh, totally new, looking at a different page, none of that works. It has to come all the way back to here and start again and create a new page. So the, the, the thing that's most important is to make sure that your site is fast without caching. And then add the caching to make it better. So how much can your server handle? Oh, wrong way. Work out the time taken to display a non-cached page. I'll do this with you in a minute. There's also in the spreadsheet, it shows you how to do it. So we work out the number of CPU cores, divide that by the average time to request a page in seconds, and then we can get the maximum page request per second. So let's have an example. Okay, on my server, you can probably just see it, I've got 64 cores. It's just a test server, it's an old thing, but I've got 64 cores. So it's slightly more uh, capable than most VPSs that people buy. And if I plug these, this data into the spreadsheet, I'll do it in milliseconds. I've got it in seconds or milliseconds for your advantage. And so I have, oh, there it is, 64 cores. Now I'll test the site that it is. So, ACD. And notice I put something. Doesn't matter what it is, it's a thing. What that's doing is just saying make a new page because no one's ever been to this exact URL before. So I can look at the page and away we go. And, oh. Network. I'll just change that a little bit so we can look at the. Uh... Okay. So on the HTML page, if I look at timing, I can see it's gone, wow, that's really, really slow today. It could be that it's going to be faster the next time. So I'll try again because you want your aggregated score. So this time it's only 271. So I'd do this like 10 times. 
And let's just say that my tests over 10 times, they aggregate or average to 350. So let's do 350. And now the last thing to check is the number of milliseconds between clicks. So 750 would be three quarters of a second. We could say, you know, it's every one and a half seconds if we want. And if that's the case, then my server could handle 16,458 concurrent users per se or requests per second. One sec. That should say second. But if I only had two cores, I could only handle about 515 user, uh, uh, max users per second or max requests per second. So looking at this, you can kind of gauge how many times people come to my website and what I really need to buy. And um, for those that are thinking about VPSs, don't forget it's also a shared server. There will be other people on that same processor that might every now and then take a little bit more processing than you have. So it's, it can be uh, problematic if you're looking to have like really performant systems. Obviously, if we were a slightly slower website, I've got some examples here. So for example, Fluffy. I looked up um, Netherlands-based WooCommerce sites last night, and somehow this is in the Netherlands. So, again, I'll check it, and I'll do it two times just to get a bit of an average. So, 720. Uh, 798, so I'll say 750. So, if he had a mad rush, I'd only two processes. Let's give him a bit more. Let's give him 16. If he had a mad rush, he was opening a new concert tomorrow, and people were desperately trying to buy the stuff, it would fail if 2,000 people in a second tried to do something. It's just as simple as that. It's a very simple mathematic equation that we've been using for years, and you can use it also. It's uh, just the way it is. And like I say, the spreadsheet's here. You can get it from the repo. Oh. So number of cores, average time, page requests per second. So max page requests divided by 60, click frequency of users, number of simultaneous users. So I've actually put both of these into just the one spreadsheet rather than splitting them up. You can go and look at the maths, but it's all there to do both of these stages in one go. So yeah, if you're going to do a concert, get a load of cores. Yeah. As I said, don't cheat. Do cash busting and don't do it in anything but incognito because your stuff on your PC might skew the results. Oh no! Cookies, the killer of performance. Let's see if we can get a little bit forward. So, one of the problems that this website from Fluffy has is that every single uh, page loads, I won't show it, it's uh, every single page loads a new cookie, HTML cookie, sorry, HTTP cookie, that checks the uh, GDPR status, which is just ridiculous because you cannot edge cache anything that's got a cookie being set in it. So it has to wait for a future time when there's no cookies being set before it can cache that page. So keep an eye on cookies and anything that's being set up all the time. Uh, a classic example that breaks caching is when I go from one category to another, it updates a list of categories I've visited as a cookie. That can really kill your caching. Okay, scale up or scale out. Vertical versus horizontal scaling. Um, scale up is pretty painless. Scale out or vertical, more systems put together. It's a whole world of problems. Uh, this is what I used to run. So I had a load balancer 
a number of web servers. We had something to do with session management, an NFS drive, an object store, which was memcache, and then a database cluster. And just the effort of getting other developers to understand this was massive. And simple little things like you want to update a plugin. If you update the plugin and you happen to be on this server, it's not updated on that server. So you have to then start doing definitely get deployment, CI, CD. You have to push things simultaneously. You have to do all sorts of extra stuff that is just impossibly hard for a lot of people. So my honest advice, don't scale out. It's just painful. You can, but just expect problems, ones that you have never seen before. Because until you start working at scale, yeah. So what hosting should I choose? I try to make a simple flowchart. Do I want to be responsible? No, I do not. I don't want to have any responsibility for my hosting. I want somebody else to be responsible. When it breaks, I want them to rush around fixing it. When there's a problem, I want them to be doing everything. I, I don't want to have to think about it. I want to be able to sleep at night and not be waiting for my you know, mobile phone to go off. But other people, they want to be responsible because they feel that owning something, very common with agencies, they think, yeah, we can have our own server. But do you want to be responsible for the support and maintenance? If you do, then consider buying your own stuff. It's on your own back. I wouldn't do it, but you might want to. If you're an agency and you've got enough people, do it. What I would choose if I wanted to make some money is an affiliate program or a partner program, especially as an agency. Because then I can give all of the effort to somebody else and make extra money. So that's my advice is, how hard do you want things to be for yourself? I take the easy route because I, wa I want to make my money doing other stuff rather than worrying about computers. Well, how much should I spend? Yeah, I've talked to a number of hosting companies and uh, CEOs over the years, and we all got this kind of like, well, 2%. I mean, that's not much. Let's think about it this way. If you were earning 1000 a month on your website, 2%, 20 euros. Is that a month? No, that's nothing. That's a good place to start. If you're earning a million a month, 20,000 on your hosting isn't actually a bad idea. You have something that's more complex, more capable, more supportable. And honestly, no one ever said, I really regret buying that expensive hosting with that really caring company. So, golden rules. Focus on throughput. This is especially true for WooCommerce. How fast the database is, how fast PHP is, and how fast the networking is. Getting in there, getting out again. Host it as close as you can to where your people are. So if you're in the Netherlands, people in the Netherlands, don't host it in America. <laughs> yeah, buy from someone that's easy to contact. This is something I've learned. It doesn't matter how much you pay, they can still ignore you. So get with somebody that you have a good working relationship with. And uh, do your due diligence, especially go through the contract. If you're not going to finance, get a friend to come and help you. It's better to go and look for it four times before you sign up and know what's coming in the next thing. Because some of the hosting companies do a massive increase on, re on the, the renewals, like 3x free cost on renewals. So check what you're getting into. OK, there is a new thing for WooCommerce. It's been around for about a year. High performance order storage, and it's this. Everything used to be stored in post meta and WP post, so it was a new order. It would take, add a new post for the order, and then add the details in post meta. Well, that's really stupid, and so they've taken it to literally high school level database management, what you get taught. Split things up, have addresses in one thing. It's obviously faster. It's what you got taught. This was not what you got taught in school but it's the way that it got set up. If you're going to do it, and it's very simple, make sure you do a backup first, because it's going to try and resync everything from the old orders into this new system. And, you know, do it at night when there's not many customers. Do some testing, that kind of stuff. Okay, my opinions. These are just opinions on the future of uh, WooCommerce. It's going to be Gutenberg ready soon there will be more database expansion, just like you've seen there. 
taking things and setting them apart so they're better set up. Um, there'll be very easily adaptable REST output. If you look at the REST output of products right now, it's incredibly verbose and very large. So the benefits of going headless might be outweighed by the cost of the data. And yeah, headless WooCommerce is going to happen. It's not there yet, but it will happen. Okay, next generation performance testing. I'm going to quickly get this in before the end. See, this was the uh, testing that came out last week, WP hosting benchmarks. And it tested PHP, and yes, that's us there being fastest. Thank you. And um, yes, that's us there being, being fastest again. But I'm going to be the first one to be honest. The tests aren't good. We might have won it, but we didn't win because we were better than everybody else. Well, yeah, we were. But the point is, the tests, they don't even check the database. They just do like, for example, it writes a, li a line to the a row to the database and then deletes it straight away afterwards. It might not even get to the disk. It might still be in the cache. It's not a good test. It uh, doesn't test for WooCommerce and actual purchase. So we don't know how many, what it'd be like if 50 people, for example, were trying to buy a product at the same time. So these tests, although they have relevance, aren't great. So what I'm doing, and I'm announcing this right now, is I'm making a new set of West, uh, WordPress, sorry, WooCommerce hosting testing. I've already spoken to a lot of the CEOs of uh, hosting companies, because I know them from the WordPress hosting group. And they're going to come along and be part of this. And I'm looking for WooCommerce experts who want to come and join. I have one. Where is he gone? Where's Martin? I have one in the back there who's already agreed. And members for the supervisory board. So these guys for supervisory board, if you wish to be one, it's not that you're a hosting person or an expert at WooCommerce. It's that you're going to be there saying, oh, yeah, I understand. This is a good, good test of why aren't we testing this? Why aren't we testing that? If you'd like to be part of it, come and let me know. It's going to be much more stringent and much harder. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Uh, any questions?